Hey guys, uh, good morning. It is now 7 a.m. Uh, where I live, um, 5 a.m. where Dr. X lives, and uh, uh, 10 p.m. where Dr. Chen lives. Uh, of course, Dr. Abesani has it good because it's in the afternoon for her. So uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, second KDGO and ISRNM joint webinar on blood pressure guidelines in uh, CKD. My name is uh, Chaba Kabesdi. I am a nephrologist and a professor of medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. And I'm uh, very closely involved with ISRNM uh, with various functions. I am happy to be hosting and sharing um, this session. Uh, I will start by introducing uh, our esteemed uh, faculty. Um, our first speaker will be Dr. Joachim X, who is a professor of medicine and the uh, chief of division of nephrology and hypertension, as well as vice chair for faculty affairs in the Department of Medicine at the University of uh, California, San Diego. Among his uh, numerous uh, accolades, uh, the reason he is invited is because he was a prominent member of the uh, recent KDGO blood pressure guidelines, and uh, he'll be sharing his experience and knowledge uh, on that. And we also have, uh, as one of our speakers, Dr. Sue Firth, who has some technical problems, but hopefully she will be able to join a little later. She is the executive vice president and chief scientific officer directing the Research Institute at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She previously also served as vice chair of the Department of Pediatrics, associate chair of academic affairs and chief of the division of nephrology. She is a very prominent pediatric nephrologist, a tenured professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Epidemiology at the Paramount School of Medicine at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. We have uh, two um, esteemed academic dietitians also on our panels and as speakers. Dr. Carla Avesani is a dietitian PhD and a senior research specialist at the Department of Clinical Science Intervention and Technology, Division of Renal Medicine, Baxter Novum Karolinska Institute. Her research is based on clinical studies investigating energy expenditure, body composition, and dietary patterns of patients with chronic kidney disease. More recently, she became more interested in the role of healthy plant-based diet in mitigating the nutritional disturbances related to, uh, to CKD. Then we have Dr. Maria Chan, is, uh, who is the lead uh, renal dietitian at the uh, St. George Hospital, Sydney, and honorary associate clinical professor at the University of uh, Wollongong, Australia. Her works on teaching and research are to improve the outcomes of patients with chronic kidney disease. Last but not least, uh, one of our panelists is a patient representative, Mr. Tim Slater, who is the ISRNM patient representative and uh, he is also on the patient resource committee for uh, ISRNM. Uh, hopefully he will also be able to join us uh, a little later and join the discussion. So with that, I will start with a brief uh, introductory presentation um, to provide some background uh, for today's uh, talks. Uh, please, uh, my colleagues, help me out. Am I sharing it right, or are you seeing the uh, speaker version? You have it please. on the speaker version. Okay. I'm sorry. It should be good now. Thank you. Um, so again, welcome to this uh, joint uh, webinar. Before we uh, get to it, I'd like uh, to have a few administrative uh, uh, slash general presentation, general uh, uh, recommendations and uh, um, uh, issues to present to you. Uh, of course, we are the International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism. Uh, you can visit our website for uh, uh, news and various events. And most importantly, I have to uh, uh, announce um, the upcoming uh, ISRNM, ICRNM uh, 2022 conference. Um, this is the 20th Congress of the International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism, which will be held on June 16th through 18th. Um, in 2022 in Guangzhou, China. Uh, it is a hybrid Congress uh, due to uh, COVID restrictions. Uh, only local um, uh, uh, conference attendees will be able to attend in person, um, although that's not a certain either, but uh, uh, for uh, um, outside of China, uh, it will be a, a, um, a virtual uh, Congress. Early bird registration is about to end, so uh, hurry to register. Uh, and the abstract uh, submission site uh, is uh, still open. So please present your uh, research uh, there. Uh, then I have to announce uh, uh, the inaugural joint webinar uh, of the International Society of Nephrology. Uh, 
and ISRNM, ISN ISRNM on global kidney nutrition care, which will be held on April 26th uh, at 4 p.m. Central European time. Um, you can register uh, for this either on the A ISN or the ISRNM uh, website. Um, then there is another uh, joint webinar between uh, IFKF, uh, this is the International Federation of Kidney Foundation, World Kidney Alliance, and ISRNM. Um, this uh, will have uh, presentations on the pros and cons of plant based diet and chronic kidney disease, including the live debate. Uh, as you see, uh, very esteemed uh, uh, presenters. The date of this is on May 4th, uh, 2022. Again, you can register uh, for this webinar. Uh, on ISRNM's uh, website on isrnm.org. And then finally, just a few appetizing recipes here from the ISRNM uh, website. You can find a lot more resources uh, uh, there. Um, so with that, uh, let's start talking about uh, our theme for the day, which is the uh, KDGO uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines for Blood Pressure Management with a focus on uh, dietary and behavioral interventions. And before I um, hand it over to my colleagues, uh, I wanted to show you a few background slides uh, on blood pressure because blood pressure is really the archetype of uh, cardiovascular risk factor. And uh, interestingly, um, uh, records of blood pressure measurements date back to the 18th century when um, uh, this fellow here, uh, Stephen Hales, who was a physician, um, apparently cannulated the um, carotid artery of a horse and then uh, noticed uh, the, the uh, length of the uh, blood column uh, in a attached uh, glass tube, which was a very early measurement of blood pressure using invasive hemodynamic means. Um, during the subsequent centuries, there were attempts to uh, record uh, various aspects of blood pressure. And here are some invasive and non-invasive, uh, uh, very complicated contraptions that really all they recorded was pulse waves uh, at this stage. Um, and as, as these became more complicated and the non-invasive, uh, the major breakthrough really happened at the end of the 19th century when uh, Rivarocci introduced the modern circumferential blood pressure cuff, which was uh, the modified slightly by Recklinghausen, who started using larger size cuffs. I mean, this is all bread and butter for blood pressure specialists nowadays. And of course, then at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Nikolai Korotkov introduced the modern auscultatory technique. Um, and as you could say, the rest is history. But interestingly, uh, while uh, blood pressure measurement became possible, the adverse effects of hypertension were not at all apparent. And just to illustrate this, I'm showing you um, uh, the, uh, the page of, uh, first page of uh, the St. Louis uh, Post-Dispatch on the day after uh, President uh, Roosevelt, uh, that's FDR, died, uh, apparently from a uh, cerebral hemorrhage. And um, they say that it came out of clear sky, says the president's physician. Um, so, uh, yeah, they didn't have a clue that he was at risk for this, but when you look at his blood pressure recordings, um, according to this, at least, um, uh, shortly before he had this uh, acute event, his systolic blood pressure was close to 350 and the diastolic close to 200. Uh, yet, apparently, this event came out of uh, clear sky. Of course, uh, then uh, came uh, uh, Framingham, and shortly after that, in the early 60s, randomized control trials showing that all of these adverse events can be uh, prevented um, very successfully by, uh, by lowering um, uh, elevated blood pressure. And since then, hypertension has become a core cardiovascular risk factor that is prone to intervention and, uh, and should be affected by therapy. Um, so uh, our focus is really patients with uh, a chronic kidney disease. Uh, and, and they have always been sort of a special group in this respect. Um, and there's many, many aspects of this debate, I just want to point out a few um, uh, perhaps important um, uh, pointers here. Uh, so we all regard patients with CKD um, as a population with um, uh, worse hypertension, with uh, uh, a very high prevalence of hypertension. According to some studies, 90-95% of all patients with CKD have hypertension. But really, when you look at the details, it's, it's not just the same type of hypertension. Uh, this is a study uh, from Ann Haynes that compared uh, patients with normal kidney function and those with CKD for their blood pressure. And indeed, the mean systolic blood pressure was higher in those with CKD, but their mean diastolic blood pressure was in fact lower. And they had a markedly elevated pulse pressure compared to patients with normal kidney function. And about twice as many of the CKD group were on antihypertensive medications. Uh, so, so clearly, there is more here than just the same mechanism uh, being exacerbated by uh, CKD. It's probably uh, 
uh, very complex uh, factors uh, coming into play with this different phenotype. Also, when we treat hypertension, um, the uh, um, um, issue of, of uh, what you lower and what that does is very interesting. Um, you know, here is a early study from uh, more than 10 years ago uh, showing an association uh, between the number of antihypertensive medication used and systolic and diastolic blood pressure in individuals without chronic kidney disease on the left and with chronic kidney disease on the right. And as you can see, of course, this is reverse causation. Not surprisingly, those with higher systolic pressures had more antihypertensive medications, and there was no association with diastolic pressure in non-CKD patients. Interestingly, in the CKD population, there was an association with both, but those with higher numbers of antihypertensives had in fact lower diastolic pressures. Again, emphasizing this duality, you know, you're treating systolic hypertension, you're lowering diastolic blood pressure, perhaps to levels that may be unsavory. So, so uh, there, there is some interesting features here in CKD that warrant special attention. And last but not least, uh, I wanted to uh, illustrate, uh, you know, uh, what we're treating, what we're trying to prevent. Because traditionally, um, hypertension has been regarded as a cardiovascular risk factor. So you want to prevent events that are related to that, such as strokes, such as uh, coronary disease. Um, um, but then, you know, patients with chronic kidney disease are typically older, and they have a very high mortality rate. So that sometimes competes with these endpoints. And having sort of a sense of, of what's more likely to occur in these patients is important. So this is a study from a very large population of US veterans with chronic kidney disease showing uh, uh, here different age groups and uh, mortality rates as a function of uh, uh, different blood pressure categories, systolic blood pressure categories, showing this fairly well described U-shaped association uh, between systolic pressure and all-cause mortality. But then, you know, if you look at uh, incident coronary heart disease, if you look at strokes, and if you look at ESRD, there is actually linear association between systolic blood pressure and these outcomes. Interestingly, though, the actual event rates for these were really much lower than, uh, than all-cause mortality. So this all has to be put in this interesting context. And then age comes into uh, play as a very, very important factor. So if you have a young patient, let's say less than 50 years old, um, their risk of ESRD with elevated blood pressure is incredibly high and actually exceeds that of their uh, death. So these are patients who absolutely need to be treated very aggressively uh, to prevent these um, cardiovascular and renal endpoints, as opposed to those who are more than 80 years old, in whom the relative importance of these you know, clinical endpoints uh, clearly related to hypertension are dwarfed by uh, all these other causes of all-cause mortality that may be related to, uh, to, uh, to things like uh, you know, uh, malignancies or who knows what. So um, with that, again, just a reminder about uh, our Congress. Um, and. Um, I'd like to hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Joe Ix, who uh, will be giving our first presentation on uh, lifestyle and dietary interventions uh, in uh, hypertension and CKD and ESRD. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kvezdi. Um, let me just uh, pull up my slides here. I hope that everybody can see that. So. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, join this symposium uh, and uh, to tell you how excited I am about the uh, really, truly international um, uh, aspects of what we're doing this morning uh, with everybody joining from all over the world at all different times of day. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful to meet with you all. Um, so I have a, a short presentation that uh, really tries to just summarize um, the way the uh, KDGO uh, blood pressure guidelines uh, working group uh, approached lifestyle factors uh, in its work in developing uh, the blood pressure guidelines, which were published uh, last year in 2021. Um, and uh, we'll just go through this and, um, and I'll try to make the key, the key points here. See if I can advance. So firstly, uh, again, the focus here is on the KDGO blood pressure guidelines. This was published uh, as a, um, as a uh, in Kidney International uh, in March of 2021 um, and has been uh, already hotly debated around the world, uh, both in regards to um, measurement of blood pressure and blood pressure targets, uh, as uh, Dr. Kovesdi already uh, alluded to, uh, and is something that, that I'll briefly mention just for, for, for um, context, but we'll really focus on the lifestyle factors rather than blood pressure targets. Uh, 
Um, the KDEGO guidelines, just to remind you all, um, each guideline uh, uh, comes with two grades. Uh, first, um, uh, a grade for how uh, for for the strength of the recommendation. Uh, there's only two levels here. Level one is for a strong recommendation, and I posted here how we uh, believe these would be interpreted, whether uh, this was being applied to an individual patient, being uh, interpreted uh, by clinicians for their practice, or uh, more largely uh, for policy decisions. Uh, and the second level is a level two or a relatively weak uh, uh, recommendation, which really uh, acknowledges um, the level of available evidence and the fact that uh, we recognize that um, people might uh, utilize individual choice uh, and it may be harder to make policy recommendations based on weaker recommendations. Um, secondly, there's a grade for the quality of the evidence, which I have below. Uh, this, is, this grade goes between A and D. You can see that A is the best for high quality evidence where there's true confidence in the estimates that are being established. And if you get to level C or D, you can see that there's um, much lower quality of evidence and there's more uncertainty about the quality of the effect. I think the key thing that I wanted to um, bring forward as we uh, talk about this is that the work of the KDGO blood pressure guidelines was very narrow. Um, and so, you know, we were really focused on the intersect of blood pressure and chronic kidney disease and whichever intervention you might be looking at. So much of this work was on uh, blood pressure targets, but you could uh, you know, change that to a, a lifestyle in, uh, intervention. For example, uh, should individuals with chronic kidney disease lower their dietary sodium intake? And the focus of the guideline committee was um, specifically on the effects of blood pressure in patients with chronic kidney disease in terms of that intervention. So for, there may be an intervention, for example, that has very good health benefits in chronic kidney disease patients, but if there was not good evidence that that, uh, that, that intervention had its uh, beneficial effects through a blood pressure lowering effect, uh, then that was con uh, considered not to be a key focus of these guidelines. So it's really just this very narrow area of overlap of whatever intervention with blood pressure specifically in the setting of chronic kidney disease. Uh, kidney disease. The other comment that I think is key to make is the focus of these guidelines were specifically on non-dialysis chronic kidney disease. Uh, so nothing that I'll speak today uh, um, is relevant to uh, dialysis dependent uh, uh, patients with kidney disease. The um, uh, uh, headline uh, 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 recommendations that came forward from the KDEGO guidelines are summarized here, uh, just to put them here for context. Um, and is really not the focus of my presentation today, um, but um, uh, are key for everyone to understand. Uh, the first recommendation was regarding to how blood pressure should be measured. Um, and the working group felt uh, very strongly that um, as uh, um, targets for blood pressure become lower and lower, it's more and more important to have precise measurements of blood pressure given risk of um, uh, measurement error, which might um, induce uh, some individuals or policymakers or what have you uh, to target blood pressures to be lower when in fact they're already low already if not uh, properly measured and the concern that that might lead to harm. Uh, and so for that reason uh, in particular, uh, the guidelines made, it, made its first recommendation to use standardized office blood pressure measurements as uh, in preference to routine office blood pressure measurements for the management of high blood pressure in adults with chronic kidney disease. Um, what this means is doing blood pressures in a manner consistent with what's done in most clinical trials. Um, and uh, we can talk more about that, but the, uh, the, the key aspects of it is uh, truly having uh, a five minute rest period uh, before blood pressure is measured, measuring blood pressure three times with a uh, appropriately sized cuff, and using the average of that blood pressure uh, for making decisions about management rather than um, uh, routine office blood pressure, which many of you know is a blood pressure that may be made right when the patient comes into the clinic um, uh, you know, without the five minutes of rest and often not repeated three times. Uh, as Dr. Kovesdi um, alluded to, uh, there was also a recommendation in regards to the target. Um, uh, this was a 2B recommendation where the working group suggested that adults with high blood pressure and chronic kidney disease be treated to a systolic blood pressure less than 120 millimeters of mercury 
using standardized office blood pressure measurements. Um, and here I just want to make the point uh, of the last, uh, the last part of that, that this is really based on standardized office blood pressure measurements. And the KDUGO guidelines are silent about what the appropriate target ought to be if using routine office blood pressures, again, because of concerns of substantial measurement error in uh, routine office blood pressure measurements. So that's a very brief summary about uh, the guidelines overall, um, but I briefly or I rapidly want to uh, transition to uh, lifestyle factors. And in regards to lifetime, lifestyle factors, there were really uh, two recommendations that were put forward uh, from the KDGO blood pressure guidelines. Uh, and I'll uh, take you through those here. Uh, the first one was in regards to sodium intake. Uh, this was also a level 2C recommendation, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the uh, guidelines uh, suggested targeting a sodium intake of less than two grams per day, which is equivalent to uh, 90 millimoles of sodium per day in patients who have high blood pressure and chronic kidney disease. And secondly, uh, the guidelines suggested that patients with high blood pressure and chronic kidney disease be advised to undertake moderate, intensive, uh, moderate intensity physical activity for a cumulative duration of 150 minutes per week or at a level co compatible with their cardiovascular and physical tolerance. Again, a 2C recommendation. So you can see from both of these that they are we suggest recommendations and that the level of evidence supporting these recommendations uh, in patients with chronic kidney disease, again, focusing on the uh, blood pressure and other health benefits that uh, fall subsequent to blood pressure uh, was relatively weak. So how did we get to these two recommendations? Um, so I'll begin with um, something that happened uh, serendipitously, but I think was helpful. Um, in the uh, year preceding um, the work group's work, um, the uh, National Academies of Medicine had uh, convened um, uh, a working group to reset uh, the dietary reference intakes for both sodium and potassium intake uh, in the general US population. Um, and uh, as part of this work, the uh, uh, National Academies um, uh, DRI group uh, was focused on not just the effects of uh, sodium and potassium on uh, blood pressure, but also on uh, chronic disease specifically. Um, and through this work, uh, commissioned uh, several large um, uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses to evaluate uh, the available literature in regards to sodium and potassium intake in particular and its effects on both blood pressure and uh, adverse uh, health outcomes. And so what I've uh, grabbed here on the left is a summary meta-analysis that was uh, part of the National Academy's uh, publication, uh, Resetting the Dietary Reference Intakes for Sodium and Potassium. And it shows uh, a meta-analysis on the left. You can see that this is stratified by parallel trials versus crossover trials, uh, looking at the effects of dietary sodium intake on systolic blood pressure and specifics here um, <clears throat> uh, across these different set, uh, studies. And all of these were um, uh, scaled essentially to look at uh, relatively similar reductions in sodium based on the available data. Uh, and what you can see, whether you want to focus on uh, the parallel trials themselves, the crossover trials, or a summary point estimate, is that there was clear evidence with relatively low degrees of heterogeneity that reducing dietary sodium intake had a, uh, an effect of lowering systolic blood pressure in these trials, most of which were relatively short term, some of which uh, extended to uh, several years. Um, on the right side here, we have a meta regression plot, <clears throat> um, which uh, many of you are familiar with. Each of these dots is a different clinical trial. Those with larger circles are larger trials. Those with smaller circles are smaller trials. And it looks at the, um, the estimate uh, across a range. And what you can see here is uh, just a dose response relationship that the uh, magnitude of difference of sodium intake between two groups in these clinical trials uh, resulted in greater reductions in blood pressure. So for example, a, a 20 millimole per, uh, per day difference in the two arms resulted in a relatively small reduction in blood pressure versus a 100 millimole difference between the two arms resulted in a, a larger reduction in blood pressure. The other point I want to make here is just the magnitude of blood pressure effects 
are relatively modest in the general population. You can see that again, a hundred millimole difference, which is a relatively large difference in sodium intake resulted in about a five millimeter of mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure on average in, these, uh, in this uh, meta regression. So the take home points that I would highlight from, uh, from this work is that at least in the general population, randomized clinical trials consistently demo, uh, demonstrate that dietary sodium reduction reduces systolic blood pressure. Uh, and then secondly, that in the general population, there's a dose response relationship where greater uh, dietary sodium reduction results in greater blood pressure reduction. So I think this is helpful context and we'll come back to this briefly in the setting of chronic kidney disease. Um, but before we do, um, I also wanted to highlight that at least in the general population, um, there is uh, data to um, demonstrate that these uh, reductions in sodium may actually have benefits in uh, health outcomes. Um, as it relates to chronic kidney disease on the left, again, we have a meta-regression plot. Um, and the point of this meta-regression plot really is that um, the magnitude of uh, dietary sodium reduction um, was more pronounced in patients that were more hypertensive at the initiation of the trial. Uh, you can see here again on the x-axis that patients with higher blood pressure seem to have greater reductions in systolic blood pressure with sodium reduction interventions. Um, and on the right, um, there are, um, uh, as you can see, five different studies that um, were randomized clinical trials looking at different uh, um, sodium interventions, uh, different sodium uh, dietary sodium reduction interventions, and have now been followed for, um, for many years looking at long-term health outcomes. And so um, using meta-analysis of these studies, um, one can now demonstrate that there, is, there appears to be a reduction in the incidence of cardiovascular events in individuals that were randomized to the lower sodium uh, uh, arms of these clinical trials, um, suggesting uh, that dietary sodium reductions and short-term reductions in blood pressure from these interventions may actually translate into improvements in hard uh, clinical endpoints, something that is absent in the CKD literature. So the take-homes from these two slides, again, in the general population, the magnitude of uh, systolic blood pressure reduction uh, for a given reduction in dietary sodium intake is magnified in those with higher blood pressure. And I think this is relevant because as we've just been shown, the vast majority of CKD patients are hypertensive. And so perhaps there are more benefit uh, uh, for dietary sodium reduction in our population. And secondly, at least in the general population, long-term follow-up studies of dietary sodium reduction demonstrate reductions in cardiovascular incidence. And again, I think this is particularly relevant because this is the leading cause of death in CKD. So moving from there to the CKD population uh, in particular, um, here I would say that the data is much more sparse. Um, and most of the uh, available data are data um, quite uh, similar to the trial that, or the, the trial that I have uh, highlighted here, which I think is a very elegant study. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to highlight just to give you a sense of the available data that we have in the setting of chronic kidney disease. So this study was published by Dr. McMahon uh, in Jason in 2013. Uh, it's a relatively small study, uh, I believe uh, 20 individuals with an EGFR uh, between 60 and 15 who were uh, randomized in a uh, short-term crossover study uh, in a very elegant fashion. So all of these individuals were uh, patients, again, with chronic kidney disease that had a run-in period where they had a reduction in their dietary sodium intake <clears throat> uh, to less than uh, 90 millimoles per day, uh, and then were randomized either to uh, remain on that diet with a placebo tablet or were uh, uh, randomized to a tablet that contained uh, uh, sodium chloride. And in this way, and then we're crossed over. And so in this way, um, both the uh, energy intake, the potassium intake, uh, and the underlying uh, diet remained the same, uh, but what was altered was the, the content of sodium chloride in their diet. Um, on the left, you can see basically uh, the distribution of what these individuals looked like. You can see their mean age, uh, about 40% were diabetic, and their uh, blood pressure at the start of this trial was about 151 millimeters of mercury. And again, this was done by, um, by uh, ABPM measurements. You can see that at the time of uh, enrollment, their urinary sodium was uh, 126 millimoles uh, per day, so higher than the target set forth by KDGO. On the right, 
I think are the, um, the, the, uh, the perhaps the most interesting results from this study. Uh, you can see that uh, on the low salt diet, uh, they were again, they were um, on a low salt diet targeting less than 90 millimoles per day and achieved a mean sodium of excre excretion of 75 millimoles uh, per 24 hours, which is uh, quite low. Um, and on the high salt diet, when this is supplemented with sodium chloride, of course, the sodium excretion is higher. Um, you can see that potassium and energy intake remains the same, uh, irrespective of which arm these two, uh, in these, these individuals were in at the time that they were, um, you know, in that arm. Up top here is the magnitude of blood pressure change, and I'll highlight, uh, again, a, very, a relatively dramatic reduction in blood pressure with this low salt intervention. You can see that the main re mean reduction in systolic blood pressure was about 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, perhaps a little lower by uh, 24 hour mean blood pressure, um, uh, but, but again, quite an impressive reduction in blood pressure. And finally, and I think importantly, uh, this short term intervention appeared to have uh, substantial reductions or to lead to substantial reductions in albuminuria, which is a key indicator of risk of chronic kidney disease and long term follow up. But what's not available in this study, or really in uh, the, the, the vast majority of studies that were reviewed by KDGO. Um, is uh, long-term uh, data in terms of the uh, health benefits um, or consequences in terms of cardiovascular disease from these uh, sodium reduction interventions. Um, on the heels of the data I just showed you, um, I wanted to highlight this study, which was published um, by uh, Hido Lambers, Hirspring and Kidney International in 2012. This is a really fascinating um, uh, reanalysis of two clinical trials, the RENAL trial and the IDNT trial, which all of you may be familiar with. These are landmark trials that were conducted in, uh, in patients with chronic kidney disease that were randomized to um, uh, ARB therapy uh, and really demonstrated the benefits of ARBs for the prevention of progression of chronic kidney disease. Um, what, what this uh, reanalysis did was to examine the, um, the risks and benefits of, um, of ARB therapy stratifying by dietary sodium intake uh, in these trials. Um, and what you can see on the left here, and very similar to what was seen in the previous uh, short-term study, is that if you stratify these individuals based on tertiles of 24-hour urine sodium excretion, you can see that the first row here on the left that had the lowest urinary sodium excretion um, had the greatest reduction in albuminuria and the greatest reduction in systolic blood pressure over the first six months of the study with less dramatic reductions in those with greater urinary sodium excretion. And if you look on the right side, looking at um, uh, clinical endpoints, uh, on the top we have renal endpoints um, uh, and you can see the non-RAS uh, group on the left and those uh, on ARB on the right. Um, once more, you can see that those with the low sodium excretion in the light gray bar appeared to have the most benefit from ARB therapy in terms of prevention of renal events and on the bottom cardiovascular events. So again, I would frame these as uh, secondary data and observational. These individuals were not randomized to differences in uh, sodium intake, but rather to ARB therapy, but the data are consistent um, with the data shown on the previous study, that it appears that those taking or consuming less sodium um, will uh, have uh, lower albumin excretion and perhaps greater benefit from therapies that are used commonly in chronic kidney disease, most notably ARBs, which I think is an important consideration. So based on uh, the available data, um, uh, I think, we can summarize um, the, uh, the findings as follows. So we, we, we find that in the general population, dietary sodium restriction lowers blood pressure um, and that there appears to be a, a dose response relationship and it appears exaggerated in those with the highest baseline blood pressures. Uh, also in the general population, uh, dietary sodium re uh, restriction appears to lower CBD events. Moving forward to CKD, dietary sodium uh, restriction results in short-term reductions in blood pressure as in the general, uh, in, in the general population, but the data on long-term outcomes are not available. Dietary sodium restriction appears to improve antiproteinuric effects of ARBs and may also increase their benefits in preventing long-term CBD and renal outcomes. 
Um, and then from there, um, really we have limited data on in terms of the best target for sodium intake. Um, but the levels that uh, have been tested in uh, the study that I showed you, as well as um, several other studies in the setting of chronic kidney disease, typically target levels of roughly less than 90 millimoles, of le uh, millimoles per day of, uh, of, of sodium intake, which is also a recommendation uh, for a target that's been used by the Institute of Medicine, the World Health Organization, and others. So really this target of less than 90 millimoles per day is because we have short-term safety data suggesting that this is safe in chronic kidney disease. And by aligning to this level, it would allow guidelines to be consistent in terms of their targets, which we thought might be helpful for policymakers in terms of targets. Um, just two slides on uh, potassium intake. Uh, again, I'm moving back here to the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, uh, who, who again evaluated uh, potassium intake uh, uh, and its effects on blood pressure and health outcomes to highlight that once more in the um, setting of the general population, um, there is uh, evidence that potassium supplementation will reduce uh, blood pressure, as you can see here, against, again stratified by parallel versus crossover trials. Um, so why is there no comment about potassium intake uh, in the KBGO guidelines? Um, so unfortunately, um, we, you know, again, here is a, a summary, potassium containing supplements appear to lower blood pressure in the general population. Unfortunately, because of concerns of hyperkalemia, um, persons with chronic kidney disease have effectively been systematically excluded from almost all RCTs evaluating potassium supplementation. Uh, there are some uh, very recent uh, exceptions to that, which I think will come up in our discussion with the other uh, speakers momentarily. Uh, some, but not all, observational data also demonstrate that higher potassium intake may be associated with higher risk of CKD progression in CVD. Uh, I did not show you these data, but there are observational data from the CRIC study suggesting that uh, higher 24-hour urine potassium may actually be associated with higher risk. And so um, those are observational and, and hard to interpret, but, um, but worth noting. Um, so whether potassium-containing salt substitutes may have health benefits or unique risks when applied to chronic kidney disease populations require further study and precluded us from making recommendations given the limited trial data in the setting of chronic kidney disease. Um, finally, uh, physical activity was also challenging for us uh, uh, in the working group. Uh, we acknowledge that there's ample evidence that regular physical activity lowers blood pressure, lowers body weight, uh, improves dysglycemia in the general population. And again, once more, uh, data is much more limited in the setting of chronic kidney disease. Um, when we looked at the available data specifically on the effects of physical activity on blood pressure in chronic kidney disease, you can imagine that the amount of studies are very low. Uh, in fact, we uh, found one such study uh, uh, in a systematic review, which looked at uh, 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 changes um, over 12 months uh, and showed some improvement in systolic, and blood, uh, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure, um, and also very low quality evidence suggesting that there may be an improvement in GFR. We noted that observational data show a dose response relationship between greater physical activity and lower risk of mortality, specifically in the setting of chronic kidney disease. But again, it was hard to know if this was mediated through blood pressure effects. Uh, furthermore, we, uh, the, limited, the literature was quite limited about the types of physical activity. Should it be restrictive versus aerobic? Does it need to be supervised or can it be unsupervised? And what are the critical elements of exercise interventions that might, might be most individual or most, in, most helpful in the setting of chronic kidney disease? Um, so what to do in the light of uh, very limited data, but some data? Um, so we, we ended with this recommendation where we wanted to align uh, uh, with um, recommendations from other uh, key guidelines. Uh, and there are key guidelines from AHA and ACC um, uh, in regards to the, 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 the quantity of, of exercise, which we align to, even though we didn't have uh, specific data in the setting of chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, finally, the working group recognized the high degree of comorbid comorbidity and differences in health in our chronic kidney disease patients, recognizing that many of them may have had amputations, may have, many of them are very frail, may have, many of them have, may have had a, a heart attack or may have heart failure. And so it may be very hard to achieve these targets in everybody with chronic kidney disease. 
Um, but we believe uh, that even lesser degrees of exercise were likely to be beneficial uh, for blood pressure in even such patients, leading to the recommendation uh, that was put forward. Um, finally, there's some key practice points which align to that. Um, again, uh, you can see practice point number 2.2.1 to consider the cardiorespiratory fitness status, physical limitations, cognitive function, and risk of falls when deciding to implement uh, physical activity and its intensity. Um, and secondly, that the form of intensity of physical activity should be considered and modified as necessary in individual patients. But again, that we still believe that there are likely to be health benefits, even if physical activity falls below targets proposed for the general population. And with that, I'll stop. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and for the uh, invitation to participate today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. X. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, we will hold the questions to the end. And now uh, we wanted to uh, have a dietitian's perspective on, uh, on some of these interventions. So uh, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Carla Adesani, uh, who will start this presentation. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes. But not in the in the present presentation mode. Now it's on the presentation mode, it is, correct? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. very good. So I would like to start by thanking um, the organizing committee to invite me to be a panelist of this very nice international event, gathering two organizations that to me are very important for the clinical care of patients with chronic kidney disease, such as the CADIGO and the ISRNM. And uh, while we were planning this uh, event today, uh, Dr. Kasaba and Dr. Joe X asked me to prepare some slides showing what are the dietary practical aspects of sodium and potassium management in patients with chronic kidney disease. And this is what I will try to summarize very briefly in the next slides. And um, okay, I'd like to start by giving this perspective that I have when planning the diet of patients with chronic kidney disease, that as a dietitian, what I see sometimes is a puzzle where we need to combine different elements from the diet following all the recommendations, which include potassium, protein, liquids, energy, fibers, sodium. And all of this we need to combine according to the patient's food preferences, socioeconomic conditions into a diet which is healthy and feasible for the patient to follow. So it's not always an easy job. I, I could say uh, that's my vision, but it needs good planning and a lot of uh, well, good alliance with the patient. And since we are today talking about this guideline on blood pressure, I will just summarize what we have as recommendations for dietary potassium and sodium for patients with CKD according to the guidelines we use the most. So for sodium, it seems that there is a consensus that it is important to decrease the sodium intake to levels from 2 to 2.3 grams of sodium per day from the different guidelines we have. As Dr. Joy X described, although the, the evidence level is weak, is to see, we do have some studies that gives a background uh, for this recommendation. Uh, although we don't have long-term studies. But for potassium management, what we see up to now, it's a, it's a more difficult scenario where the, the general idea is that the potassium intake should be restricted if the patient has hyperkalemia to levels that goes from 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams per day, but yet, this is based only on opinion because we do not, do not have studies to support why is this threshold, the threshold that is uh, stipulated for patients with chronic kidney disease. And the reason why we don't have yet values that can give a background for the amount that is safe for these patients is that as Dr. Joe also has pointed out, all the patients that have chronic kidney disease, they are excluded 
from uh, randomized clinical trials that it tried to evaluate the effect of the potassium intake on serum potassium of these patients due to the concern of hyperkalemia. Um, the first guideline that I am aware that tried to uh, contextualize the potassium intake uh, in a more individual level is the NKF CADOC nutrition guidelines where they recommend that the diet should be adjusted to maintain normal kalemia instead of giving a threshold of how much potassium we should recommend for the patients in the diet. And I think this brings up a new idea where one should really uh, individualize the recommendation according to the clinical condition, to the glomerular filtration rate, to comorbidities that are present, and also to the patient food habits. One common consensus that there is regarding potassium intake is that, as also pointed out, out by Dr. Joe Ix, is that uh, salt substitutes containing potassium should not be included or uh, should not be recommended to these patients due to the fear of hyperkalemia. And in order to, and, and, and these recommendations that we have for the sodium intake for patients with chronic kidney disease aim in the patients with CKD stage three to five, not on dialysis, to control blood pressure, to decrease proteinuria, and to control the disease progression. And for patients on dialysis, the idea is to control the intradialytic body weight gain, since a diet that has more sodium is increases thirsty and the patient for the patient is more difficult to control the intradialytic body weight that has an uh, important effect on cardiovascular disease. But after all, in, in, in the clinical practice, in order to achieve a diet that has low sodium content, what we do as dietitian is not only asking the patient to decrease the use of sodium chloride in the diet, but also to replace the use of ultra-processed food and processed food for foods that are natural, foods that are not processed. And this sometimes becomes a puzzle for us dietitians because these are the foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and beans, which contain high amount of potassium. So this is the puzzle that we deal on our daily lives with patients with chronic kidney disease. So what we know is that if we increase the, if we completely take out all the whole foods from these patients, we may in a way uh, protect for the increase in serum potassium, but on the other way, we will have a diet that has very poor dietary quality and can lead to other problems, other comorbidities in these patients. So after all, it's important to have a balance where patients are able to eat fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, and those, those foods that have lower potassium content as compared to fruits and vegetables that have high potassium content. And we also have evidence on studies that patients on dialysis that have a higher serving of intake of fruits and vegetables here, you can see more than 10 servings per day of fruits and vegetables. They have a lower chance of non-cardiovascular mortality and all cardiovascular mortality as compared to patients with a lower intake of servings of fruits and vegetables per day. So, uh, my point of view, according to studies, is that by restricting completely or making a very restrict control of foods that are source, source of potassium, we end up also harming the patient. And I think it's very interesting in these studies that in this particular study, that when they compared the, the serum potassium according to the servings of, of fruits and vegetables that patients were eating the day, you can see that the serum potassium is not different from the patients that has more than 10 servings of fruits and vegetables combined to the patient that has only five servings of fruits and vegetables combined per day. We have other observational studies 
uh, that also showed that there is no association between potassium intake and serum potassium that I will not describe here in detail due to the lack of time to make this properly. But I would like to share with you this new study that was published last year, which to me is the first randomized controlled trial evaluating the role of the dietary potassium intake in patients with CKD on stage three. So this study included patients with normal kalemia, and these patients were randomized either in a diet with higher potassium intake with almost 4,000 milligrams per day, or in a diet with low potassium intake with 1,000 milligrams of potassium per day, which is very low. And these patients were in these diets for two weeks, and then they were crossover taking the other diet for another two weeks. So in total, the study lasted for four weeks. It was a, the sodium content of the diet was 3.3 grams, so a low, low sodium intake. And it was a controlled study because the patients got the meals in the hospital and they ate only the meals that were provided to them. So it was not to increase adherence to the diet. And what we see as a result from this study in terms of blood pressure is that the systolic blood pressure decreased and almost reached a significant level. And the decrease was higher for the, 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 the high potassium diet as compared to the low potassium diet. At the diastolic blood pressure, no difference was observed. As regarding to the serum potassium over time, there was a, a higher uh, increase in the serum potassium in the groups than the group that was randomized to the high potassium intake as compared to the low potassium intake. And the increase was in the 0 0.21 millimole per day, uh, per, per liter, I'm sorry. So it seems like there is a role of potassium in the, in the serum potassium of the patients. But this was yet a study that lasted only four weeks and with 29 patients in total. So we still have, we still need more studies to confirm the result of this finding, but it's a, a sign for us. So another point that I'd like to talk with you about when we think about potassium and sodium intake is that we should also be very uh, concerned with the use of ultra-processed food by patients with chronic kidney disease. And why is that? It's because this type of food contains a lot of additives that are based in potassium and phosphate and sodium, all of those not beneficial to our patients. And these uh, uh, ultra-processed food are those that we understand as foods that we buy in the supermarket and we buy it ready. So are ready to eat foods like some type of breads, snacks, processed meats, unprocessed meats, even wine, processed juice, and ready to eat meals. Uh, we also should be concerned with the sodium reduced products because they have this label sodium reduced products and patients sometimes may think that this is good for them since they are, have chronic kidney disease and hypertension, but these products, they replace sodium chloride for potassium chloride. And this is not clear in the label. It's not clear that there is this replacement. What we needed to teach the patient is to look for this E508. This is the symbol for the sodium, for the sodium, uh, the potassium chloride in the label of the, the sodium reduced products. And these food additives, they are used as stabilizers, emulsifiers, thickeners, sweeteners, preservatives, and colors. They are all used and authorized by the food for the food industry to use in these products. And the problem with this uh, potassium additives in particular is that their bioavailability is much higher as compared to the potassium that is present in fruits and vegetables. So as an example, uh, the potassium bioavailability of food additives is close to 100%, but from fruits and vegetables is about 50 to 60%. And not all products have uh, the, in the label 
the presence of the potassium additives. And if they appear, they appear on codes, which are not so easy to understand. I am becoming myself quite obsessed. And every time I go to the supermarket, I'm taking more time than usual by looking at the labels. And these are all the codes for potassium additives. Nowadays, we have 14 potassium additives that are allowed to be used in the processed foods. And uh, we need to teach the patients to read the labels, not only for these complicated names, but also to teach the patients to read for these many codes, E202, these codes that signs up for the presence of potassium additives. Today in the morning, while I was preparing for this lecture, I looked at the additives that are based in sodium. And I could not even list here the name because they are much more than potassium additives. So the sodium, additi the sodium additives are much higher amount than the potassium additives in ultra processed food. One uh, future perspective that we might have for patients with chronic kidney disease to allow them to eat a more liberal diet and a more healthy diet, but yet being studied, is uh, the use of potassium binders to treat for hyperkalemia. And currently here in Stockholm, in our department, we have an ongoing study where we evaluate if we can give to patients a healthy diet with uh, 4,000 milligrams of potassium per day uh, with the concomitant use of a uh, lowering sodium medication called sodium zirconium cyclozilocate. So this is yet a feasibility study, and we will include 30 patients. So far, we have 18 patients that concluded the follow-up. And what we do is that we include patients with hyperkalemia. In the first three weeks of the study, the patient is controlled with the use of sodium zirconium cyclozilocate to normalize the plasma potassium. And these patients are advised by a dietitian with a low potassium diet and a low protein diet. And they come every week for potassium measurements and also to evaluate the adherence to the diet. On, week, uh, on the third week, on day 21, the patient starts a healthy plant-based diet, which consists of a food basket that we deliver to the patient with a servings of fruits, vegetables, nuts, white meat, whole cereals uh, for the patient and for every adult living under the same household. And this patient continues with this healthy plant-based diet for another three weeks uh, with the use also of sodium zirconium cyclozilocate. And again, he, the patient returns every week for measurement of potassium and also to assess the adherence to the diet. And uh, I'm not, I will not share the results today, but we are looking that we are showing, uh, observing uh, promising results with this strategy that can be one way to allow a more healthy diet for patients that are prone to develop hyperkalemia. So I will finish my talk by trying to connect the dots when we think about a diet that is low in sodium and potassium for patients with chronic kidney disease, how we can combine both. And I chose this image of a banana, which is the image that symbolizes potassium intake for all of us. So I think the first lesson that, lesson that I gather over the years as a dietitian is that we should ask patients to avoid ultra-processed food because they have potassium additives, sodium additives, and phosphate additives, in addition of being high in sodium regardless. And also to ask patients and educate them to avoid foods with salt substitutes and teach them that this is the symbol that they should look for because it's not always written potassium chloride, but more the symbol the cold, I mean. Uh, I also would say that we should not restrict healthy foods before giving a careful thought on the serum potassium, on the glomerular filtration rate, on the current potassium intake, because it's sometimes patients receive a restriction in food sources of potassium, but in fact, 
he or she will not benefit from this restriction, either because the patient does not have hyperkalemia or either because the patient has hyperkalemia, but the cause of hyperkalemia in this patient is not related with the diet, but with the decrease in the GFR, with the use of antihypertensives that increase the reabsorption of potassium in the, in the nephron. So it's important to give a careful look and really individualize the dietary prescription. Uh, but if dietary potassium is needed, there are ways to do it in a way that the diet, the diet can continue being healthy. And one way to do this is teach patients how to replace fruits and vegetables with high potassium content for those with low potassium content. So creating lists that can make substitutions. It's easy for the patient to understand and it's really feasible. Patients can follow these lists. I can also say that by cooking vegetables uh, in water uh, and drawing the water and then washing the vegetables in cold water will decrease the potassium content of this food, of the fruit, of the vegetables and beans in about 60%. And it is a way to allow a, a, a diet with legumes and beans and vegetables, even if the patient has uh, hyperkalemia. And I also say that regarding sodium, we should uh, develop material to replace sodium chloride for herbs to add taste. And this is also feasible, but we need to educate patients to do so, and also to educate patients for not using potassium chloride. And finally, uh, I believe we should prioritize a diet that is healthy, considering the patient's food has habits, cultural and social economic condition. And um, yeah, this is the end of my talk for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Avesani. This was a wonderful presentation of uh, a lot of practicality and a lot of uh, um, useful information for both uh, patients and uh, practitioners. Um, we are out of time, so uh, uh, I will um, um, open it up for just one or two questions uh, that were posed uh, online. Um, there was an interesting one asking uh, whether a DASH diet um, is appropriate for patients with chronic kidney disease. I know it's sort of a variation of this last presentation, but uh, you know, what, what would be the, uh, the answer for that? And I'm, I'm posing this primarily to our dietitians. My dear Sean, would you like to answer? Do you mind repeating the question again? It, it's, about, it's about DASH diet in patients with CKD. Is it appropriate to prescribe <clears throat> them a DASH diet, which is high in potassium and low in sodium? It's known to lower blood pressure, but obviously it has these issues of potential hyperkalemia. Okay, um, I reviewed the uh, DASH star for CKD before and uh, in one of my article. Um, the DASH star is really, um, the style is good. It's very rich in fruit and vegetables. Uh, my answer would be like in the early stages of CKD, potassium is not really an issue. So I think a diet that's high in fruit and vegetable and grains, they are all very good. But one thing is like the DASH star is actually quite high in protein, which is contradict to the usual CKD diet. So I would suggest that to combine the both, like the DASH diet style or the Mediterranean diet style together with the K key guidelines for the protein sodium recommendation and the energy recommendation. So it's a combination of all these. Thank you very much. It's very, very, very interesting. Of course, uh, we see patients placed on a DASH diet uh, and when they're admitted to the hospital with CHF and sometimes they ignore their advanced CKD, so it can be a problem. Um, one thing we didn't discuss is, is how these apply, how these all of these restrictions apply to children, of course, who are growing and whose dietary needs are quite different. So I know this is very difficult to summarize very briefly, but maybe I can bring in Dr. Firth uh, to give her perspective on, uh, on, on what do you do in patients, uh, on children with CKD? How do you manage you know, the, these dietary restrictions of sodium, potassium, um, for blood pressure and other endpoints. Thanks for the question. I, I first wanna say how wonderful the talks were from my colleagues and um, I'll comment on pediatrics. Um, 
the issue of growing children is an important one. And I think the, the thing that comes to mind uh, as the most strong point is thinking about protein as children grow, it's very important to include a dietitian in that planning because um, despite CKD, there certainly are protein and caloric needs that we have to keep in mind in order to maintain growth for children. So that's one point. As far as the guidelines and the evidence base, I will um, echo a few things that uh, Joe Ick said in the beginning. Uh, a challenge in pediatrics for any of these lifestyle interventions and even BP management is there's really a dearth of uh, clinical trials, particularly randomized clinical trials in children on which to, to glean really strong evidence. We, um, we, the data that does exist is often small numbers or observational. And um, in thinking about extrapolating some of the recommendations that we've seen today about BP targets, about sodium and potassium uh, amounts, we, um, the evidence that does exist suggests that directionality is similar. Um, so the BP targets, it does appear, we have one large randomized controlled trial, the ESCAPE trial, that suggested that lower and more aggressive blood pressure targets to, to around the 50th um, percentile by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, that there were benefits in slowing progression. As far as the dietary targets, what we do have is observational data, the dietary and physical activity targets. What we do have in children is observational data that suggests very high um, salt intake generally, and also very low levels of physical activity. So I think that um, directionally, the observational evidence that does exist suggests that um, as in the adult targets, really targeting uh, certain levels of physical activity per week and lowering salt intake analogous to the adult um, targets are what we need to target in children. The one other caveat about salt for children is we think about underlying diseases are different for chronic kidney disease in children. And one has to keep in mind those children who have underlying urologic disease, which are a large proportion of children with chronic kidney disease may be salt wasters. So one really does have to keep that in mind, particularly in, in, um, you know, in certain times of the year and with high levels of physical activity that restricting salt um, you have to be cognizant of the underlying disease. Wow, this is fascinating. And yet again, we're reminded that children are not small adults. <laughs> yes. uh, and that's Thanks. the old adage. Um, so very, very interesting. And you know, just a comment, uh, um, maybe uh, a, lo a lot of our data is indeed observation, both adults and, and children. And you know, we have to be very careful how we extrapolate that. And especially issues like how we measure uh, potassium intake, uh, sodium intake. It's it's a very difficult thing to do. Our dietitians have most experience in ex uh, in measuring that from from diet data, uh, but some of these studies use uh, urine data, and and we all know uh, you know how how uh, difficult it is to have accurate estimates when you use a spot urine, uh, anything uh, with, with creatinine used as uh, as a normalizing factor in the denominator, and, and some of those studies did use that as well as uh, even 24-hour urine collections for sodium is, is a very fascinating area where some studies have suggested that uh, you'd have to collect several of them to get an accurate assessment of daily intake. So we need to um, be cognizant of, of these uh, limitations of our data. And obviously we always say that uh, clinical trials are needed, which is sometimes easier said than done, but definitely for some of these interventions to um, uh, determine what their long-term impact is that would be necessary. Um, so um, we went a little bit over time, but I think this was an extremely informative session. And I would like again to thank all of our speakers and panelists for participating and contributing uh, their expertise. Um, before we end, I'd like to uh, remind you that um, the recording of this uh, session will be available um, uh, on uh, both uh, our website, ISRNM's website, and on KDGO's website. So uh, you can go there and uh, re-listen to it.
And also, also, I would like to remind you that there will be a joint session with KDGO at the uh, ICR and then with the June Congress in, in China. So again, uh, I would urge you to uh, register and participate um, uh, in the activities of the Congress. Uh, so with that, uh, again, I would like to thank everybody's participation um, and um, have a good day. Thanks.